Hi, everyone. I'm Kari Bradley. I'm the general manager of Hunger Mountain Cooperative here in Montpelier, Vermont. And I am Michael Levine, the owner of Flywheel Communications. Michael and I are going to talk a little bit about how our cooperative thinks about member particip participation and engagement. And we're going to be referring a lot to an uh, engagement process that we did back in 2006 that was around expanding uh, the facility at the time. Which is how I got involved, because I do a lot of outreach and communications work. And the co-op was trying to figure out how to do a better engagement process with its members so that they could get involved in basically helping them redesign the building they were in and expand it. So it was an interesting situation. In 2006, we were on the heels of what had been a very divisive engagement process back in 2003. At that time, the co-op had a pretty clear need to expand its building and had done an engagement process. But it, apparently at that time that there was not enough faith in leadership so that when there was an approval of the, of the um, process, a lot of um, sort of uh, uh, countervailing forces came out, um, other voices, and that ended up being rescinded. So in 2006, there was even more compelling reason to, uh, to have an expansion, but, but the community was clearly divided. And so it really took a sort of a full leadership um, uh, concerted effort to um, communicate to members why we needed to do something, how they could, what the information was, how they could become involved and stay um, engaged through a year-long process that ended up being. And I think that was an important point is that uh, we, we wanted people to, s we wanted to demonstrate to people that we were serious about this, that they were going to take our time and um, put a lot of effort into informing them of what, about what the issue is and then listening um, to what they had to say and hopefully reflecting back what was most important to them in the final, um, the final plan. My recollection is I was brought in pretty early in the process. And one of the first things we did uh, with the council and I guess the facilities committee that was working at that time was really set up a structure for how this was going to roll out. So essentially, because the co-op was committed to about a year-long process, we set up three phases of this. The first phase was basic education and outreach to let the members know why this was going to be happening, how they could be involved, at what point their input was going to be really useful, and the different ways that they could come to us with information. The second phase was more of evaluating what had been told to us about a specific design, and then coming back with draft drawings and saying, OK, does this reflect what you were telling us in these small group meetings? And tweaking that, fine tuning it. So by the time the third phase of the actual vote and vote information came around about nine months later, the membership had been very involved and understood what was going on and felt like the plan really reflected the values that they were telling us they wanted to see in this building in terms of scale, in terms of uh, cost, in terms of creature comforts, in terms of backroom safety for the staff, things like that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it was the, really the second phase, of the phase that, that was critical. And, and there, the people, many, most people recognized that we had done the work of really soliciting the input and then feeding, you know, feeding that back through the, the proposal. And I remember a number of people saying to me at that point, well, you clearly have done, done the work. Uh, you know, I may, may support it, I may not, but I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to oppose it because um, you, you've clearly done a good job with, you know, in the responsible um, leadership of, of including as many voices as possible in this. So that was really an instructive piece to me. And then from, from there, it was a matter of, of um, fine-tuning and then con continuing throughout the year um, of letting people know what's going on and how they can be involved. Because when you're talking about a community of thousands of people, it's very, very difficult to reach everyone, but you have to try. Some people could come to meetings, some people couldn't. Some people could give us input through a store survey or talk to a council member who was literally sitting at a table in the store during this, this period of time. But I think there, there were a lot of people who really felt like it wasn't 
in their interest to expand the store. They were very concerned about the cost and what it would cost the members. And, but eventually, they all came around to the fact that not expanding the store was probably also not in their best interest and accepted the fact that there were more reasons to do it than not do it. And as long as it was done, as I said, to the scale and to the temperament that they felt kept the spirit of the co-op, they were fine with it. And I think finally at the annual meeting where the vote results were announced or discussed, I guess? We, we, dis we discussed at the annual meeting in a group of 150 or so people and we had received overwhelming support. And then we actually, um, as per our bylaws, mailed a ballot to every single member. Um, we had um, a very successful outcome. A third of our members voted, but by far the highest um, in, in my tenure. And, and we had 93% approval rate. So we, you know, it, it's hard to get 93% of anybody, much less co-op members, to uh, agree to anything. And, and we felt very good about that. And, and that served us going forward because, you know, as with most expansion plans, you have some rocky periods, you have some discomfort for um, everyone involved. And people were uh, excited enough about this project that we were able to weather that. Um, and, and really, um, that taught us a lot as a co-op about how to think about member engagement. So since that time, our council and management team have identified at least one issue every year um, that's on a governance level to, to reach out to members and, and talk about um, what the issue is, um, what, you know, what the information so they can make a, um, have you know um, informed view, and then we you know listen and try to come up with whatever um, uh, plan going forward that reflects their input. And it's seen as the content of the issue is important, but but we've actually systematized this this way of um, keeping members engaged so that they understand that they um, that they own a business that has a variety of issues that it's. An, um, it's uh, helpful to stay I informed about and, and that they also have a voice in, in the direction of the co-op. And regardless of the issue, I think the keys stay the same. One is honesty, so that they feel like they can trust the co-op, that it's a process that really is honest. Transparency, we're constantly feeding back whatever we hear in lots of forms so that people can feel like they were actually heard. And then responding to it in a way that shows yeah, we weren't just listening for the sake of listening, but we're going to go ahead and do what we plan to anyway. But actually making shifts, making changes, adjusting things um, to reflect the view of the membership. One, one thing that is an easy pitfall, and I think the co-op here in Montpelier has overcome it, is to hold a meeting. Whoever comes tells you what they think. Maybe you hold a second meeting. Maybe the same people come, because those are the people who like to come to meetings. And you walk away from that and say, OK, well, we heard from our members. And then somewhere down the road, you enact what you thought you heard from the members. And you realize they were reflecting a very small percentage of your membership. So you really have to make the extra effort to engage people in lots of different mediums, because everybody won't show up and talk about it at a meeting. Yeah, and you know, just sort of at the top level for me, I, I think Going, doing, approaching it this way, approaching thinking about membership this way, and very intentionally um, you know, spending resources and time and effort to ask members what they think, informing them and asking what they think, and then responding appropriately, is really one of the, the the most important things that we can do to demonstrate that we are a cooperative, a, a member-owned business, and responsive to their needs, and and. And that, of course, highlights the difference between us and our competitors, and, and I think serves us in the long run. It's sticky. It's messy. <laughs> it's a lot easier to have a board of directors that you know, sits in the CEO position and says, OK, this is what our five-year plan looks like. Let's roll it out. But it really doesn't engage people, and it's not in the co-op spirit. And eventually, you're not really going to get away with it because your members own you. And they're going to rebel at some point. And so you're just going to be totally uh, derailed from whatever you thought you were going to do anyway. One last little uh, piece that I would say is that you, it is absolutely critical that you go into a process um, of engaging your members with the um, sincere belief that their input can improve whatever plans you have. If you're not genuine about that, uh, uh, people will see through that and you might as well not bother. It's, it would be worse in the long run. Um, 
but the beauty of it is that uh, your plans can be improved by member input. Uh, you know, um, getting getting a couple hundred minds on an issue um, will almost and some time will almost always result in a better result. So, um, you know, you can have faith in that in that approach. And that's why I think it was actually a really good match between because I I'm all about getting people involved in decision making. I do a lot of work up at the state house also, and it's just about giving people a voice because the people really have a lot of great ideas. And if you just give them a platform to share it, everybody's going to wind up being better off. Oh, a bonus round. <laughs> bonus round. That was awesome. <laughs> and, your, and your bonus round. Well, one thing that comes to mind is um, you're following the same principles of sharing information, you know, perhaps um, some inspiring forward thinking, and then painstakingly taking the feedback and adapting the, whatever the vision is and reflecting the, you know, the input that you're getting. And it's probably going to take more time because it's, you're, it's you know, futuristic and it's uncertain and conceptual. Um, but it's this, I think it's the same idea as if you're if you're building consensus through a participatory um, process, um, I got to believe you can get there. And if you're talking really about moving the co-op ahead and what do you need to do through this kind of engagement, I think part of it is you need to at first find out what might be holding the members back from moving forward. And get a sense of that. You know, a lot of small group discussions really help that. You get some ideas on the table. And then you say, OK, here's the things that they're fearful of. Uh, let's address those and start, again, once again, with education, just like with that first process. Explain why we think that this is the right direction for the co-op for these reasons. Everybody may not agree, but I think most of the membership would at least begin to understand what the issues are, whereas before, it's just the leadership thinking about it. So you've got to always go back those two steps and bring the membership along. And they're going to tell you if you're completely wrong. You know, they'll give you a, a knee-jerk reaction and say, no way, no how. But if you can inch them along and at the same time modify maybe what your goals were, then you hit that middle ground that's the right direction to go.